It's Monday, tomorrow, 6 a.m., and your alarm goes off. In an hour, you'll be dressed out the door and on your way to another day at work. So how do you feel? Well, maybe not so great. <laughs> First, you, may were, you maybe were sleeping pretty soundly when that alarm went off. Secondly, if you are like over half of American workers, <laughs> according to surveys, you really do not like your job that much. There are a lot of folks who live basically four weekends and that, those three weeks of vacation. W work is something you endure more than enjoy. Now, there can be a variety of reasons for that, but, but often a, a big factor in job discrimination is a, a poor relationship between the employee and the employer, between the, the boss and the workers. People don't usually like their jobs very much if they don't like their supervisor if they, or if they don't like the people they're supervising. And that's why you might be pretty happy if you go to work tomorrow because you know your boss is going to be out of town for the next two weeks. So now you're excited about work. Well, friends, as we've gone through the book of Ephesians over the past six months, we've seen that as a person uh, becomes a Christian, a person becomes a Christian by trusting in Jesus Christ, as Savior and Lord, by grace, through faith, in Jesus Christ alone. We have also learned that we, when that happens, when we become a believer in Christ, we become a different person on the inside. And, and that should impact then how we live, not just on Sunday mornings, but seven days a week. And in recent weeks, we've talked about how the Lord expects us to relate to our, our spouse and to our children and parents. And today we focus on how being a Christian impacts our relationships when we're on the job, when we're at work. Our text is Ephesians chapter 6, 5 through 9. And if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn there. Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. This is one of those very practical passages that may hit a little too close to home. In other words, you might be thinking, how did Pastor Dan know about me? Um, I don't. But these are the words that God has for us today. And, and I believe as we hear what the Lord has to say, he will help us avoid situations at work that can really make our lives <laughs> rather miserable. So let's just pause and pray that God would use his word to help us honor him even when we are at work. Thank you, Father God, for the Bible, the word of God, the truth we find again on every page, in every sentence. And once again, Lord, we pray that we would be able to hear these words and understand these words and realize what they mean for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we look at this text, we see that the Apostle Paul has some instructions for first century slaves. Ephesians 6, 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Now, actually, I, the ESV, which I usually use, has the term bond servants instead of slaves. Uh, and that's because there's a significant difference between slavery in the first century Roman Empire and the slavery with which we are most familiar, which is the enslavement of African Americans in the southern United States before the Civil War. However, just so there's no confusion, these individuals to whom Paul writes are not paid servants with Tuesdays and holidays off. 
bond servants were required to work for their masters. And they uh, often do so for their entire lives. Under a simple definition, they are slaves. So, maybe some of you are asked thinking this, why doesn't Paul, in this passage, simply condemn slavery? Why doesn't he say, why doesn't the Bible say, slaves rebel against your masters because they have no right to treat you like property? Why doesn't the Bible just condemn slavery? Here's a, here's a three-part answer to that question. Uh, first of all, abolishing slavery in the Roman Empire would not necessarily have been humane. Historians estimate there were 60 million slaves in the empire at that time. And many of those individuals enjoyed better conditions than slaves in other places and at other times. But yeah, they are still slaves and it's not any fun. Yet life for many in the Roman Empire was not fun. And if slavery would have been abolished overnight life likely would have become more difficult for many of those 60 million people. After the American Civil War, ma many black Americans freed from slavery faced real challenges adjusting to life as, as free men and, and women. In, in the Roman Empire, those challenges would have been much greater. Now, does that mean slavery w was a good thing? Uh, Roman slavery was a good thing? Not, not at all. But it does mean that Paul and the other apostles likely realized that uh, the emancipation of slaves was not only an unrealistic goal, but if successful, unintended negative consequences would increase human suffering. There were reasons the early church did not make the abolition of slavery their top priority. Secondly, I would just say that Paul knows that there is a bondage more terrible than slavery. It was during a horrible famine in, in Africa a few years ago in, in Ethiopia that a pastor there said, my people's souls are more hungry than their stomachs. You see that they have no food. Their stomachs are empty, but their souls are even more empty. And it's a reminder that sometimes we're struck by the obvious physical needs that people have and as a result miss the less obvious but equally real spiritual needs. And some of those spiritual needs have eternal consequences. And I think the New Testament church recognized that, yes, slavery was evil and that a lot of things in the Roman Empire were wrong, yet their primary concern was to do something about the evil that exists in each human heart. And by proclaiming the great news of Jesus Christ in the midst of that far from, in that far from perfect world, they were striving to do something about that evil within each of our lives. Thirdly, I would just say the Bible does destroy slavery's foundation. Even though the New Testament does not attack the institution of slavery directly, it strikes a mortal blow against that. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 28, Paul declares, There is neither slave nor free. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. All are one. All are equal. Some, some folks try to discredit Christianity by claiming, well, the Bible, does, uh, Bible condones slavery. And yet, the reality is, without the New Testament, slavery might very well be a thriving institution today except for God's revelation through his word. Because the abolitionist movements in the United States and in Britain and throughout the world have almost always been led by Christians. William Wilberforce, for example, 
evangelical leader in, in England in, in the early 1800s. He is the man who devoted his entire career to fighting the slave trade. And yes, it's true, there were many Baptist pastors defending slavery in the American South, but they could only do that by coming up with bizarre interpretations of Scripture, such as the curse of Cain. And they had to ignore the liberty that pours out of the New Testament gospel. Christians who recognize that the Bible teaches that all human beings bear God's image who realizes that the Bible teaches all Christians are equal in Christ, they have been leading the fight against slavery around the world for centuries and continue to do so today uh, against the various forms of slavery that still exist within our, on our planet. Okay, let's think about how Paul's words to slaves are also words for Christian employees. Wait a minute, Pastor Dan, I am not a slave. <laughs> I, I might be employed, but I'm not a slave. What, what do instructions for slaves who lived almost 2,000 years ago have to do with me going to work tomorrow? Well, yeah, Paul is writing to people in a different situation than we face. And yet, Think, think about this. If slaves who had no choice about the work they did and who received no compensation, if they were expected to serve wholeheartedly, as verse 7 says, the slaves were to work wholeheartedly, then Christian employees should certainly be willing to do the same. If Paul expects First century slaves to respect their masters and work with enthusiasm? Doesn't it make sense that he would expect employees in 2022 to do the same? Paul insists that, that Christians who are working, whether slaves or employees, they should have a new perspective. As a believer in Jesus, you should have a new perspective on your work. Listen to verses 5 through 7. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. Folks, as Christians, we need to realize that no matter what our job is, we are really working for Jesus. We're working for Jesus. So when you go to work this week at, at Hib Tech or at Walmart or maybe it's the Chisholm School District, you are really working for Jesus. Yes, there is a company or there's an organization who pays your salary, you likely have some type of supervisor or boss, but you're really working for Jesus. And if you keep that in mind, it will help you avoid a couple of mistakes that are sometimes made. First mistake is to think that your supervisor or employer is your ultimate authority. No, he or she is not. You know, even if you're a slave and, and there's a conflict between what God has said and what your master commands, you should obey God. And when you're on the job and, and your boss asks you to do something which is wrong, which is morally wrong, you should refuse to do so. Because what God says is more important than what your boss says. Now, that's not usually an easy thing to do. And I know sermons uh, often make things sound real black and white, but when you get to work, you find yourself in, in a situation that seems pretty gray. For example, no, your boss, he doesn't ask you to lie, but he may want you to never mention certain information to any of the customers 
counsel? Should you follow his wishes? I don't know. If you're, if you're selling a radio that's going to blow up as soon as somebody plugs it in, yeah, you better tell the customer about that. But, but again, your prior, priority must be work to work in a way that pleases the Lord. That's what you're called to do. Work, do your work in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. Now, many employers value workers who stick to their convictions and who, who insist, for example, on being honest. But e even if they don't, even if they don't admire your honesty, Jesus does. Jesus does, and, and he's the one who counts. He's the one who counts. Knowing you're really working for, for Jesus also helps uh, you avoid the mistake of making the job the number one priority in your life. Ray Kroc, founder of McDonald's, used to say, the three most important things in my life are God, my family, and McDonald's. And when I get to work, that order is reversed. No, no. As Christians, that order should never be reversed. Our love and commitment to our, our job should, should never equal our love for God. Nor should it equal our love for our family. If you are working for Jesus, if he is your boss, he commands you, keep your priorities straight. God comes first, your family comes next, and then your job. Paul's focus, however, is that if you are working for Jesus, if you see yourself as working for Jesus, it will improve your attitude toward both your employer and your job. No, you won't treat your boss as God, but you'll probably treat him better than you do now. And no, you will not see your job as the most important thing in your life, but, but you will very likely view it as more important than you're viewing it right now. You'll have a new attitude. And as Christians, we, we, we're to be concerned about the interests of our, of our employer or, or our supervisor. We, we want what's best for him or for her. Listen again to Ephesians 6.5. Uh, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Again, employee, employees are not slaves. You're not slaves. But much of what Paul says applies. A Christian employee is not just to look out for himself or, or herself, but you're to think about, well, what's good? What would be good for my employer? Uh, Christian employees seek to develop that, a, a balance between labor and management that is often very elusive in our current context. Christian employees strive to treat their boss as they would like to be treated. For example, they're honest with their boss. They tell the truth. One morning, uh, Joe's boss asks, Say, hey, Joe, do you, uh, do you believe in life after death? Joe responds, Well, yes, yes, I do. Well, good, the boss said, because after you took the day off yesterday for your grandfather's funeral, he stopped by here to visit you. Okay, maybe Joe had two grandfathers. I don't know. But more likely, he probably lied to his boss. See, the Christian employee should not be stretching the 15-minute coffee break into a 30-minute uh, break all the time. Uh, the Christian employee should not be complaining about the boss to other employees always. In other words, if you're a Christian worker, you should love your boss. Love that person. Treat him as you'd like to be treated. And, and if you do that, your boss may be shocked. He might think, he or she might think, well, I, I, think, I think that person's just trying to get a raise or a promotion. But uh, that's okay. Your fellow employees may not be thrilled by your attitude, but it is the attitude the Lord expects from you. Your boss, your supervisor, your employer, that is a human being. And you're to love.
that person, just like you are called to love your enemies, you're called to love your boss. Christians should also have a new attitude toward work itself. Verses 6 and 7, a bondservant of Christ, as a bondservant of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. Oh, one of the most important things is that as a Christian, understand that your job is important if it is work that God has called you to do. If, if God has called you to do that particular job, it is important. It's an important job because God has called you to do it. Now, if God hasn't called you to do that, then you need to get another job, okay? But if it's what God has called you to do, it's important. Martin Luther said this. He hit the nail squarely on the head. He says, the work of housewives and shopkeepers is just as holy as that of a clergyman. To wash dishes or to mend shoes for the glory of God is no less a sacred task than preaching the gospel. Some of you don't, we need to talk because that doesn't make any sense to you. But it does. It means if, that Jesus, you are working for Jesus, and if he has called you to wash dishes or mend shoes, that's what you need to be doing for the glory of God. Now, you might not think your job is very exciting. I, I would, it probab your, your job probably is better than being a first century slave. No matter what, what it is, you, you probably have a better job than that. Okay? And if, if they were to do their work with enthusiasm, <laughs> you should probably do your work in that way as well. Now, uh, there are, are some folks who view work as kind of a necessary evil. The only, the only reason I work is so I get a paycheck, so I can pay my bills. That is not the biblical perspective. Work is not a result of a fall. In the book of Genesis, it tells us that Adam and Eve were put in the garden, not just to relax, not just to smell the flowers, but they were put in the garden to work. Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And Eve was to share in that assignment. The curse found in the next chapter, Genesis 3, that's when work now becomes difficult. The Lord says it will now require painful toil for human beings just to get enough food on which to live. The lesson from Ephesians is that we as Christians now have the opportunity to head back toward Eden before the curse. To head back to a situation where our, our work can become meaningful because we're working for the Lord and, and it can actually become enjoyable. And this new perspective can eliminate much of the dissatisfaction that people feel with, with their jobs and it'll also go a long way of getting rid of some of the conflicts we have at work. We're heading back to Eden where work is not just a curse, but it's something that God gives us the opportunity to do. Okay, now let's consider some of the implications of what Paul says for those who do not have a job. And there's a few of you here that are in that category. Some of you, for example, are students. You're not employees, you are students. You're in school. Maybe, maybe you're in, in college or high school, grade school. Um, you're in a public school, private school. Maybe you're homeschooled. Whatever the situation is, if you are a student, you are to have a Christian, God-honoring attitude toward your education. Because in a sense, that is your work. And you are to be diligent in doing your schoolwork. The goal is not always to get A's, no, but it is to learn, to learn the things that God intends you to learn. So you study for the sake of the Lord Jesus. And 
you should also treat your teacher, who is kind of like your boss. If you're homeschooled, your teacher's kind of like your mom, but she's your teacher. You are to treat your teacher with respect. And, and students, if, if you do those things, especially in a public school setting, you're letting your light shine for others. Uh, a, a public school teacher who d does not attend Chisholm Baptist doesn't, Never, I don't think she's ever been here for church, but she told me, she goes, Pastor Dan, whatever you're doing at that church in Chisholm, keep doing it because I am so appreciative. The students from your church, they're not my best students as far as grades necessarily, but they're my best students as far as respect and a desire to learn, a desire to do what a student should do. If you're at school, you can honor the Lord the same way that a Christian worker can. Some of you are, um, you, you don't have a job because you're at home. You're, uh, you're a stay-at-home mom, or I don't know, we used to call them homemakers, whatever. The, you're, you're not employed, but you do plenty of stuff at home. And maybe you're saying, you know, Pastor Dan, I can really relate to a slave. Not because my husband's my master, but rather because I don't get paid a cent for the work I do. And yet, the Lord brings great dignity to things like taking care of children and even doing housework. You, you know, you might feel bored, you feel like you're stuck at home, but if you're doing what the Lord has called you to do, you're doing very important work. And, and the motivation for a, a woman or for a man doing housework should be this. I am doing this because of my love for my family and for, because of my devotion to the Lord. In his commentary uh, on Ephesians, John Stott says, the goal for a housewife can be to cook a meal as if Jesus were going to eat it or to keep clean the bathroom as if Jesus were going to be a guest. That's a good goal. Now, those doing housework need to avoid the, the Martha syndrome. Remember, that was the sister of Mary and Lazarus. Martha was, she was so busy working, so busy with household duties that she didn't have time for people. She didn't have time for Jesus. Perfect housewives, uh, and perfect housework, perfect meals. That's probably not what the Lord is asking from you, but he does want you to do that work in the name of Jesus. And then we have the self-employed folks. And, and maybe you're thinking, Haha, boy, I'm, I'm glad I'm my own boss. I, I, I'm not accountable to anyone. I, I don't have to worry about my attitude. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong, because if you're a Christian, you're working for someone, right? You're working for Jesus. He's your boss. You're accountable to him. And that means you should be working diligently. You should be treating your customers and others with whom you deal. You should treat them all fairly and with respect. And, oh, this can be a tough one for some self-employed folks. Remember, your work is not the most important thing in this world. Some folks who are self-employed are addicted to their work. <laughs> That's not right. You are to serve the Lord. Not whatever your self-employed job is. That's not what you serve. You are to serve the Lord. And in serving him, then you do the work to which he's called you. And then there are you folks who are retired. Some of you worked for many, many years. Some of you, by the grace of God, retired when you were 38. Whatever. You don't have any boss to deal with. Right? Wrong. Wrong. Jesus is still your boss. He, he still gives instructions for you every single day. And his instructions are... Do not be idle. Don't quit sitting in front of the television or the computer screen all day long. If you are physically able, 
do something that is honoring to the Lord and helpful to other people. Volunteer work. Great idea for those who are retired. And no better place to volunteer than right here at church. <laughs> we need Sunday school teachers and people who serve on committees and people who help with various projects. They're all great opportunities to work even if you're retired. Incidentally, the word, as Roger Johnson likes to point out at age 93, the word retirement is not found in the Bible. God expects people to serve him with every breath till they, had, till they take that last breath. And as I say sometimes, if all you can do is lay in your bed in the nursing home and smile at the nurse as she feeds you, if that's all God has assigned you to do, you better do that. Smile for the glory of God at that nurse, if that's what your assignment is. Uh, many of you, again, um, retired when you were older, some of you retired younger. Um, maybe you don't think these volunteer projects seem to be all that exciting, like you're folding church newsletters or something like that. Not the most intellectually stimulating job in the world. And you don't get paid. But that's okay. If you're doing it as unto the Lord, it's a great, great assignment to have. And, and the fact that you're not making money just means that you're fine for taxes, too. Ephesians 6, 8, Whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Whenever you do work for the glory of God, you will have plenty of compensation both in this life and certainly in the next. And so, whether you are a retired nuclear physicist or a retired janitor, no matter who you are, if you serve in the name of Jesus, the Lord promises you a rich reward. Someone said the church is always full of willing people, those who are willing to work and those who are willing to let them. So if you're retired, make sure you're one of those ones willing to work. Now, one more group of folks to address. The Lord also has instructions for employers, supervisors, bosses. Some of you are in that category. Ephesians 6, 9. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Again, a, a modern supervisor is certainly different from a master uh, with slaves, but what, what Paul says does have implications for today. A Christian boss needs to recognize that, yeah, my employee is, is a Christian. That means he's a brother or sister in Christ. Uh, the Christian boss is to treat all workers fairly, all workers justly and with kindness. Christian employers should pay fair wages to his or her employees, and, and should be known for being generous. Christian foremen should not berate uh, a worker in, in front of co-workers. A Christian teacher should treat students with love and respect. That's what the Lord expects. Almost all of us act as employers in some situations. Maybe you hire someone to mow your lawn or to, to build a garage for you. You need to treat them fairly. Don't try to take advantage of them. Many Christians I know, including one I see in the mirror, tend to be kind of frugal, so I'm always looking for a good deal. I, I like to buy things at cost. In fact, one study found that people who attend church regularly are some of the least generous tippers at restaurants. We need to remember that those whom we employ to serve us, whether it's the, the, the grocer or the car dealer or the waitress, they all need to make fair wages so uh, they have adequate money on which to live. When we're employing those people, it's our job to be fair, to be respectful, and to be generous. Years ago, a, a this is a true story, a trade official from the Soviet Union was visiting a, an American factory. And at noon, the, the lunch whistle blew, 
And almost immediately, 500 men and women stop working and head out the building. Your workers, they are escaping, cried the communists. Aren't you going to stop them? The factory manager replied, I'm not worried, they'll be back. And sure enough, at exactly one o'clock, the whistle blew again, and all the workers returned from their lunch shower. After the tour, the uh, American asked, well, uh, do you think you might be interested in buying any of the products we manufacture her here? Forget your products, said the communist. How much do you want for that whistle? <laughs> Friends, as Christians, we should be motivated to work not by a fear of our supervisor, not simply by a desire to make money. We should be motivated not even by a, a magic whistle. What should motivate us is our relationship with Jesus Christ that enables us to have a new attitude toward our work and toward the people with whom we work. May the Lord help us to honor him when we're on the job this week.